Welcome everyone to another episode of Drink While You Think. I'm Kenji. That's I'm Matthew. It's good to see you guys. If you don't know by now, um, Mr. May, let's start it off. I know you've been a little under the weather. Last week I broke you out of your 17 days of at least not drinking. You probably haven't had anything to drink since then. At least I had a glass time. of wine last night. I had, okay. I had a glass of um, pork and no from the. Oh. Uh, from the or organic vineyard in Napa that we went to before QuickBooks Connect. That's right. I do remember that. It was a it was a good red wine blend. It was the first time. Um, well, in 2019, I don't believe a bottle of wine got opened and not finished in our house, but um, but it got opened and uh, my wife and I each had a glass and it's yeah. well, did you have a glass tonight, I guess. There you go. All right. So, what are you drinking right now? Okay, I've been saving this one. I don't think I've had this on there. This is kind of what's up your alley. Uh, so this is the new Belgium um, barrel aged, the bourbon aged um, from in Knob Creek uh, oh, barrels. Uh, so this is just an ale from um, New Belgium. So, so I, I, have, I don't remember if I've tried this. Looks a little heavy. So it says, it says smooth notes of toffee, vanilla, and caramel. And we got a nine percenter here. So, Ooh, it's called oak uh, something or other. Called Oak Spire, it says. Oak Spire. Okay. So, but just New Belgium. So, same people that bring you fat tire. So. Oh, love it. Uh, look at the swig. Tell me how it is. Where do you see my weird one? What do you got? Pretty good and tasty. Um, all right, check this out. Not bad. Not bad. Not bad. Taste the bourbon. The the. Yeah, I'm not a crazy bourbon fan, so you know me. So. Bad. I know. Sacrilege. I know. I've got the Baltica 3. This is a Russian beer. I forget. I think I went to the uh, liquor store one time and just grabbed a whole bunch of random things and kind of brought them all back to my beer fridge. And I forgot this was in there. It was kind of hidden. And I'm like, holy cow, how long has this been in there? But like, it's a, it's a Russian beer. Awesome. I could have saved this till I guess I mean I guess there's trying to think of some good Russian news. I guess I don't know if there's anything to celebrate Russian, but Putin hasn't done anything crazy. I mean I guess the Donald's getting impeached and some people think he's part Russian operative, so um <coughs> the Baltica three. Okay. It's kind of a lager pale ale? What kind of no, kind of a very lager it's kind of tastes like um, I mean, yeah, it's, it's very, um, very light 15.22 ounces. So kind of a weird ounces, but check this out to help us a little surprise for you here. Okay. Um, look at this. Hold on. You see that? Oh, wow. We've got, this, this is going to let other people follow along. Untapped, see that? Untapped. Uh, what is that? Untapped is an app. They also have, you can do it on website too. But you can track the beers you drink. It's oh, a kind okay. of social. So like, I was like, hey, this year let's start tracking the beers you and I drink on here. Oh wow! Okay. Let's start I'll tracking them, and um, we can invite you know people along. So what was yours again? Yours was the. Uh, I'll take a picture. I'll send you the label. No, I'm gonna put it in here right now. Oh, New Belgian Oak Spire. Okay. Uh, Oak Spire. I'm going to guess it's 2019. Um, this is the, I don't know. There it is, right there, right? Is that it? Yeah, that's it. Okay. We're going we're gonna to check in on that beer. Oh, we'll, we'll have to check in at the end. I'll, put, I'll tee it up for us now. We'll check in at the end so you can rate it when we're done at the end. Okay, sounds good. Mine's the Baltica 3. Ball the three classic, man, uh, deal. Yeah, it's a classic. I mean, look at that. So, all right, we'll come back and we'll rate these at the end. Okay. But I think people can find us on here and look for drink while you think. If you really, really want to geek out and kind of drink along with us, that is awesome. That's <laughs> a nice trade. Now I'm liking this. That's good. Okay. Uh, cool. Awesome. What do you got on tap for us, dude? Uh, oh, for the topics. Look at that on tap. I like how. You um, total accident. 
Did you see, I've got another show and tell here. I'm trying to make it more visual too. If we're doing video, I think people get tired of looking at our ugly mugs. Both of us are sitting in our basements today, um, which is where you usually are. I'm just down there to break up the scenery. Got another thing I want to share. Back. Um, you've seen our, oh shoot, I hate how this gets in the way. Uh, there we go. Uh, our friends at OnPay, one of our tech stack partners. Oh, I didn't see this. We got $6 million Series A. Did you see that? Oh, wow. Cool. And, From individuals. Oh, so Mark and the crew raised six. Um, I think they oversubscribed. It looked like they were looking for five. So Congrats, uh, Jesse. Congrats, Mark. All those folks. Great folks over at OnPay. Good to see them doing well. Um, I guess my question, though, was – you and I talk a lot about venture capital, right? I mean, <laughs> it's one of our things. And it's probably just, you and I have worked, I mean, have worked a client base, right? SaaS software companies, technology. You and I have been in it a long time, so we probably mention it a lot. But I, don't, I mean, a lot of people don't really get into it that much. Um, I guess I would say, like, what do you, who do you, I mean, how would you describe venture capital? Who's venture capital right for? Like, I think because people get a notion of like, oh, it's amazing. I raised money. Like, but really, like, in simple terms, who's venture for? Um, ventures for a billion-dollar idea, not a $100 million idea, I guess is the best way to put it. Yeah. So if you think your idea has scale at that point, um, it's also for um, – time-sensitive ideas. So if you have to beat things to market, I think is why there's not a lot of venture in accounting firms, you know? Yeah. It's just not time-sensitive, the problem we're solving. Nobody's going to beat us to market, um, things like that. Um, so the best venture capital plays were like Greenlight, like our friends at Greenlight that do the debit card for kids. Mm -hmm. like that's a great story where they just have to go acquire market share for like the kid debit card. You just got to land and expand right you got to be out there and, and cover the market i think that's probably the best case for venture capital of the kind of the local ones and the ex clients and the that the we've had that have come that route yeah so there's a yeah i agree with you i mean i think it's um there's always a lot of mystique around it right that people you know, like, wow, it's amazing. And it's, it's different. It's just different than what most people see about ways to capitalize a business. It's in the, in the pantheon of ways you can capitalize a business. It's one of the more rare ways, honestly, that capitalize businesses in general. Oh, and there's Matthew's dog saying hello, of course. But yeah, I think it's, um, again, you typically see it in the technology space. I think you're right for those who are need to go quick and need to go big um but it's a, it's a challenge i mean raising raising capital is not easy and it's incredibly expensive and so yeah, yeah i mean it's, it's expensive on two fronts i just actually updated our blog post on this um actually it's a brand new blog post um brought from a whole whole different ideas and talked about kind of just walk through the math and really people because we've been doing the you know the atlanta tech angel tech angels thing lately like really helping people understand when they take that first outside investment, that's just the first step on a path of delusion. And they don't, they really need to do the math, you know, as they go, like, of course the accountant wants to do the math, but you really need to understand the math of the dilution if things go well and really the like base case. And so I took a, like a go well scenario even. And, and by the end of your series B, you let own less than 50% of your company in a go well scenario. It's kind of a crazy scenario. So if controls your thing, BC is not your thing, right? What's it? Yeah. I mean, to that point, I was going to follow up with this and you may have hit on it, but you may have some other ideas. Um, what do most people, the lay person, right? Get wrong or not understand about venture capital. So, um, Raising outside money is the first time in your com company where you have disaligned ownership, usually. So usually the founders are trying to build something. They have this great idea. They're trying to change the world. They're trying to do something. 
Well, you bring in an outside investor and they have a timeline. They need to get money back in X number of years. Uh, an angel will say seven to 10 years. A venture capital will say five years. So as soon as you take venture capital, they need to sell your company within five years, right? For the most money as possible, which doesn't mean the best features or customer experience, you know, necessarily. Um, that disaligns a lot of times. Yeah. Uh, when you have a longer view, especially as that timeline nears, like an exit timeline, then you get really disaligned. At first, it feels like the same where, you know, we have plenty of time, we have plenty of time. Two years in, three years in, all of a sudden, you're starting to turn it into an EBITDA machine versus, you know, what's the cash flow look like versus what's the customer experience look like. Right, right. So disaligned partners, like you can happen with founders with life changes and stuff like that, but it typically happens first at a company with external investors. Yeah, I agree. I think um, as I was thinking about this, to me, I think a very, just a very common mistake people make is they see a large eye popping number, whether it's $6 million, you know, like on pages did, or many that are in the 50 million or a hundred, even more than a hundred million or more. I think people assume that those founders just got rich. And they just made a bunch of money. I mean, just to be very simple, like, Oh my gosh, I, I should go and, you know, raise venture capital. And you're like, you're not, it is un, unbelievably rare that you're taking money off the table in a situation like that. I mean, it can happen, but it's typically not happening. I mean, oh, no, not in an on pay, like in a series A VC situation, uh, you're not taking money off the table. Uh, so people think that people think that, that like, Oh, well, that's what I should just do. I've, I've heard people say this in the accounting space. Sometimes it's kind of more tongue in cheek, like a joke, like, Oh, I'll just pretend like I've got technology or go create a bot in my business. Right. And raise capital and make money. Like now maybe you, you do. That's not going to you. That's going to the business. And in fact, your bar for success just went extraordinarily higher. Now you've got a runway you've just created. You've got the ability to go out and, and, and spend, um, but not on yourself. You're not going out there buying the yacht. You're not checking out. So I think that's something that the lay person doesn't think about is that they, they tend to think that that particular, just raising the capital is the successful event. I mean, to your, you said earlier, it's just yeah. a journey. That is, you got a long way to go. Long yeah, I mean, I think that's the biggest mistake people make is they're wanting to have a press release and hit the map. And we've seen that in our space, you know, scale factor bench and people like that. They raise money and they make this big splash. We saw it with um, um, the other one, too. Um, but um, whoever's done it, like they raise money. Well, who like who cares? Like that doesn't mean anything. You didn't build anything. Yeah. It's somebody that it's worthy of an investment and and that's Who knows what the founder, yeah, the founder might be screwed right yeah let's not i mean let's not mistake it from the fact that it is a milestone it's a pretty significant one and it's an indicator that other people besides just you as the founder maybe your co-founder and a few others believe in it and that's that's important but it economically to the founders it has nothing to do typically with their success at that point. It might mean they get to continue their founder's salary, which is typically very low below market for a little while longer, but like it is not a financial um, measure of success for that founder by any means. It certainly can be a good one of showing confidence in a, in a company or in the vision, but I think people just get that confused a lot. Um, if, you were, if you were to point people, any, anything, uh, recommendations, if you were to point more people who are like interested in understanding how like venture capital works or what would you tell them to? I, I actually just did a good blog actually to be self-serving. Yeah, it's up on the acuity site. Like it's, it, it walks you through some of the math, like, okay, here's what you're likely to get diluted. Here's why, like when you go for a series A, like with on pay, like if that had been, it said it was from individual investors, so that, this might be not very typical, but with a venture capital firm, they're going to, they have a requirement. They want at least 20, 25% of the company. Yeah. But people don't realize that. Like when you do a series A, you can see, and we talked through some of that stuff too, of like how you can back into what the probably the valuation is. Cause that's not, a, that's not a disclosed thing typically with those things. Um, in some of those things. Oh, I found, hold on. Um, 
I'm going to pull it up here real quick. So hopefully that's helpful. I mean, that, I, I, we were we, we were talking about my, it's more from a lens of I'm tech. I'm pretty biased to don't raise money, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so um, um, so this, this, this one here over on the acuity.com blog site. I promise you, I didn't play, prepare this in advance. You said dot com, dude. It's acuity.com. blog site. Sorry, is this bootstrapping versus venture capital one? Is that the one? Yeah. So that's the one I just um, went through and did a long form. It's a longer blog, but um, it's you. Oh yeah. Oh nice. But dude. like this is says like how, how I much the founders, I didn't do this up, but um, this is good. How much the founders own after that? How many founders own there? Like it's just like it. See, it talks about like when you're at the Series B right there, the thirty six percent is the is kind of the average that you own after your A or B or whatever that one was. So. You know, I'm pretty biased and against raising money, which is weird that I'm the president of ATA this year. <laughs> but so, so this is kind of a, well, they said that the, our marketing firm told us that told me that there's a lot of, bi there's a lot of stuff out there about raising money and why you should raise money. And they wanted a more balanced kind of article for our site. Uh, and that's what kind of generated this. Check on our blog post. Uh, I did not know that was here. I literally just added it, but I'm glad that, um, look at, you know, I, okay. You look pretty smart in this one. I'll give you credit. Good, good numbers on that. Go take a look at it and give Matthew our time. I, a couple of folks, I, I tend to follow more kind of people um, yeah, you do. who are in the industry. Uh, and it certainly isn't you because, you know, I, I wouldn't want to give you that ego boost. Um, <laughs> Don't worry. Well, there's a couple that I recommend that I like. I like, um, so I think Andreessen Horowitz here. Um, That's a good one. For those who, those, if you're in the tech space, you know of Andreessen Horowitz, these guys are kind of almost the best, the best, but they put out great content too. I'm currently reading Ben Horowitz's second book. Um, you and I read the first one, The Hard Thing About Hard Things, and it was a killer book. And I just think the way these guys kind of get in talk, they got a cool blog, uh, sorry, podcast too, the A16Z podcast that I like. Um, I also like Brad Feld. Um, yep. a little Boulder, Colorado, Brad's been a long time, um, venture capitalist, but he's just a really unique guy too. He talks about lots of things, not just venture capital work and just a really cool, interesting guy. Even if you're not that interested in venture, he's someone who knows the space and has an interesting take. And I think locally, a lot of us take a look at what David Cummings writes about David. Yeah. I wouldn't say David. I, I was going to say DC's blog. Yeah. He's a Mean, man he puts something out every day well no i, I was looking so we got to give dc a little hard time i was looking at his blog recently he's moved i figured this he's moved to weekly now like here's a cool thing about the you know, SaaS metrics january 18th is one before that was january 11th so i think he's moved to more of a weekly yeah. rhythm but for he was five years in a row he wrote a daily blog daily five blog. years without i think he missed five days or something in five years or something that's a machine. I highly recommend it. David, I think David has a great style of writing that probably would speak to a lot of accountants because it's right to the point. It's brief. It's right to the point. Uh, very pragmatic. And so uh, a couple resources for people who are looking to learn more about uh, venture capital. Um, and even including Matthew's blog post. Yep. All right. Let's get off some of the, uh, account, not even accounting, but kind of the business stuff. So um, you did something cool this week. I did. Yeah, on Tuesday. Oh, uh, Tuesday night. Uh, yeah, I had um, dinner uh, with one of the Atlanta Falcons. Uh, so right guard, Chris Lindstrom. Um, really great guy, Boston College guy, kind of salt of the earth guy, like learning about, talked all about the NFL. He spent three and a half hours with this, you know, one of the, this is one of those, you know, you buy something at a charity dinner thing. One of my friends bought a charity dinner um, thing. and. Uh, there he is. Yeah, that's him. That's him. You, so, well, he's a great dude. Yeah. But so, that, that's got to be cool, though. I mean, that's got to be a cool thing. Like, Yeah, it was great. It was really funny because he's a rookie. He had never been in Mercedes-Benz, like where the fans go. It's the stadium. where Because kind of they're mostly Flowery Branch, so he just comes down for the games. So he still hasn't been to a United game either. So we're, we might have to hook him up with some United tickets. Um, but um, yeah, I, I would I would do that. Yeah. Uh, so um, the uh, United Atlanta United is the soccer team in Atlanta, just for everybody's edification that plays in the same stadium as the Falcons. Uh, but um, 
Yeah, Chris was a great guy. He spent three and a half hours with us. So he gave us a, you know, spent two, two hours in the stadium. We showed him around that, like where the fans go. And then because he was there, we got to go into the, um, oh, the place where the, they have the owner suite and stuff like that, which is totally being redone right now. The carpets are being refinished and stuff like that. And then he took us to the locker room. Kind of, you got a sense for like, where people sat like all the linemen and tight ends sit together over in one spot and then it's like all the receivers over here the d linemen over there it's pretty funny so you could just kind of sense what that was but for me as a kind of a geeky fan like it was just <laughs> reinforcement about most of the things i had thought about the falcons and heard about the falcons were true which was really nice you know well, we talk- you, like i was gonna say what, what are your takeaways like what you I mean what what is <laughs> What, what did you think was true and what got reinforced? Well, one of the takeaways about – well, one of the things I've always thought about the Falcons is they kind of value character over – not even over – I mean, they value character almost as much as talent. Mm-hmm. They, there's almost – there's really no – like I couldn't think of a toxic person to ask about in the locker room, right? Yeah. And then everybody I talked to – You would have asked because you just that's how you are. You're just going to – Yeah. And then like even the stuff that like – I wondered what it was like when Mosin who left. And so Mo uh, was sat right next to Chris all during uh, preseason at Flower Branch. So his locker was next to him all during preseason. And so Mo helped Chris, like, you know, was just, and I mean, and you know from everything, like Mo's kind of the character of the group. And then he got traded to New Orleans, New, New yeah, England. Right? Yeah, Mohamed Sanu went to New England, which kind of broke our hearts. And sounds like it broke know. our hearts. And, the, and you, could hear in it, you could hear in his voice where, like, that sucked, you know, when Mo got traded and stuff like that, like when he was talking about it. And then I asked him about – my favorite question was I asked him about, like, what the offensive line room was like when uh, they were on the lead-up to the Tampa Bay game when – so we had a 300-pound lineman catch a 35-yard touchdown pass, Ty Sombrello, which uh, obviously Chris knows him really well. Yeah, so, like, you, you non-football fans out there, this does not happen. Yeah, it's so it's the longest, it was the longest catch in history by a 300-pound man or yeah. larger. So Chris was talking about, you know, on Wednesday when they got the playbook, they were like, they're never going to call this in the game. And then they, like, practiced it and stuff like that. And then they talked about – they probably watched it a hundred times together afterwards in the film room afterwards. And during the play, see, they don't know if Matt threw it or not. So Matt Ryan has an option of throwing the ball to tie or throw or handing the ball off to Devonte, Right. So he's blocking like it's a run. Chris is. And he's telling the story. He's like blocking like it's a run. And then all of a sudden he looks up and Ty's got caught the ball and there's this 300 pound guy running all for all he's worth toward the end zone. And so they had a blast and that was a fun, fun into the season. It was a good, good end of the year for the Falcons for people that don't know. So. We just took you down a very, um, I mean, for me and Matthew, this, sorry, this is what, this is what the podcast is. It's mostly he and I talking, not many people watch. This is the stuff we talk about. We get very deep into specific Atlanta Falcons football plays. And the fact that you got to kind of get an insider view into it for you and I is like, makes us kind of giddy. Um, but, um, that that's awesome. That's awesome. Speaking of, but we have us nerding out. So thank you all of you who are watching, who are allowing us to nerd out a little bit. But we're going to go even nerdier. Check this out. I happen to be. I ran across this. Some more football, like an intersection of football and accounting nerddom. Have you heard? Check out this website. It's called Mock Draftable. So it basically it takes. So during when, when players are being drafted out of college and the high school, they all go do a thing called the combine. And the combine is just all kinds of measurable stats and data about these football players. And all they basically do is kind of, I think they either crowdsource or found some way to pull data from the combine into this big database. You can kind of visualize it. So you can kind of go look at like, um, like Chris, Lin- here we are. Here's Chris Lindstrom, Mike, right? So it's like, it does this kind of funky spider chart, which is kind of cool. Like you can kind of visualize and what it shows is in this case, it's his percentile rank against other offensive linemen. So you can kind of see like, oh man, like he's really fast in the 40 yard dash and the broad jump. He's very high percentages. <laughs> Dude, really small. I don't know. If sh- Look at his hand size. I don't know if he shook his hand and like, you know, it was very small. He's just a normal dude. Yeah. Dude, his bench press, he benches like 415. And he's on the 52nd. 
<laughs> but that's crazy. Isn't that crazy? So you can, you can search all these players. You want to see a really funny one. So anyways, you look at this, right, and you realize that, oh, you get all these comparisons and, like, the broader the spider chart is filled out, like, just the higher percentile, like, ranked people are. So anyway, you start thinking of players and things like this. All right, you ready to see the, the fun one, the funny, queer, crazy one? I want to see Julio, yeah. I knew it, I knew it. All right, you ready? Look at Julio's. Julio, this is almost like if you could create a wide receiver. Okay, sorry, Julio, Julio must have slipped on the 20-yard shuttle. Look at this. He's almost he has to slip. That has to be a fluke. He's almost at the edge of everything. And this is against other NFL receivers for like the past, I don't know, like 20 years. Like this is not, I mean, this is not against the average Joe, you and me. Like this is like, it's unbelievable. I happen to see this. I'm like, holy cow. Like if you were trying to build a wide receiver, that's our guy, Julio Jones. Anyway. That's pretty Everybody, cool. Apologies for the last 10 minutes of the super deep dive on, you know, uh, Atlanta, Atlanta Falcons nuance. Yeah. Um, I'll, 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 one last thing and I'll kind of sign us off here and then we'll actually, we'll go rank our beers, right? This will be a new thing you do. Um, so my interesting thing I did this past week was I, um, I got to go hear a guy. His name was a speaker. I have to look it up. I saved it real quick. Um, a guy, who's, his name is Andrew Mellon, a Mellon, I think that's right, um, who is the most organized man in the world. <laughs> self-proclaimed, I assume. I think it's self-proclaimed, but he's very organized. He's been, he's been doing like organizational consulting for a long, long period of time. It's interesting. And so he's worked with sports teams, celebrities, all these things. He does some of this stuff where he goes into um, – like these hoarders, like houses and things, and like gets things in order. So it was just a really, uh, it, it made me realize, like I was there with a bunch of other people, and like there were some who you could probably tell were that type who were like, I need to get my stuff together. Like I got, it's funny, I was more there like, because I, I, I get kind of nerdy with this stuff. Like I, I get very kind of nerdy with, like I like things organized. Like I'm kind of minimalist organized. And so um, like, he was talking about like a color coded calendar and things like that. And I was like, that's me. I got my color coded calendar and I've got my little like list of things. I mean, I'm just kind of nerdy about that, but I had two, uh, um, two takeaways. I like, well, I had a bunch of takeaways, but two of them I was going to share. That I liked that came out of his one kind of a business one, which is a good like premise. I'm going to see if I can start doing this more and more. So I have a lot of meetings each week, but his rule is, um, no agenda equals no meeting. I'm like, Ooh, I like that. Like, if you can't give the person an agenda like 24 hours in advance, like you can't have the meeting. Or if someone, someone tries to book a meeting with you and doesn't give an agenda, like, sorry, like I, I can't meet with you. Like I, we, we, are, we have to reschedule this until I know I can prepare and think about that. I, I don't know what your thoughts are about that. I kind of liked it. Like for me, it's more, I don't get invited to a lot of meetings. I, I have to, I put on a lot of meetings. So I, I'm like, all right, I got to make sure my agenda is better. Would you agree with that? Yes, changed Laura's life. Like my wife, like for her graduate students, so my wife's a professor. So like if her graduate students haven't done what they've said they're going to do before the last meeting, like they can't have another meeting until they do it. Yeah. Like if you've committed to X, like until you do X, you can't have another meeting. Um, <clears throat> I think that's a great idea, but I, I also think agendas are important. I'm trying to be better. Just saves time. Um, the second takeaway I had more personally, do you know what mise en place is? No. It's French. It's a French word. French. The only French word I know is sous vide, dude. Sous vide. No, you and I both sous vide last week. Well, actually, you'll appreciate this. This is also a French kind of, it's known a kind of a French kitchen term. And the, the French for mise en place kind of means things in place. It's right. It's basically the way that chefs and kitchens run like, Everything is really in order. So you do all your prep work before you cook, and it's, like, very efficient. And, like, that kind of speaks to me. Like, I'm, I'm, like, again, I love kind of organizing and putting things kind of in. Like, if you see certain things I do at my house, I'm a little – my family kind of laughs at me. Um, so I was thinking about that. I'm, like – so I told my wife, I'm, like, hey, you know what I'm going to do this weekend? Like, we have a pretty organized house, but there's some things in the kitchen. Like, I'm going to go through and, like – 
reorganized parts of the kitchen. And like, I'm super excited about it. Like I'm like, I'm like oh, this drawer over here, I'm gonna get fixed and I'm gonna put these things over in this other drawer and cabinet so it's much closer to where like, so mise en place, like, you know, I mean, again, we, my wife and I like to cook. She's a great cook. I like to like eat and consume and like prep for it. So she's just like looking at me like, what is wrong with you? You're, you know, and I'm like, I don't know. I'm just excited for like reorganizing the kitchen. So that's what I learned from the world's most organized man is uh, I'm going to have agendas and I'm going to build a kitchen inside the Kuramoto house. So, I'm sorry, a, a professional chef style staging mise en place situation inside of the Kuramoto household kitchen. Everyone in the house is going to Important stuff, dude. Important stuff. Um, all right, you ready to rate our beers? Yeah, I'll go. Yeah, I mean, I, it's kind of hard to rate the first one. I, it's not hard. I mean, I feel like, you know, we'll figure it out. I, I'm, I'm going with four stars for the Oaks Bar. Okay, so we're going to check in. This is what we do. We check in. And again, this is a joint account for you and me. Um, yeah. Check in. Uh, how would you like it? You would probably like it better than me. So it's yeah, up to five stars. You want to give it four out of five? Yeah. That's okay. Good. Okay. Um, Johnny's New Year's Sweet Pizza. Continue. Yeah. Oh, we lock some badges, all kinds of fun things happening. Okay, we're not going to lock oh, them. Great. Got it. I also pulled up mine just so we're ready for it. Um, oops. Did, you, did you like it okay? Um, it, it was, where the heck is this? Sorry. It's a, it's a three star, and I can tell it by your face. I've got controls here in my way that I can't get to my. Are we going to be hard graders or like easy graders? Um, I, I think we got to be honest. Isn't that what the people want? That's what the people want. Of course, I can't. Sorry, I'm trying to move all these controls. There we go. It's 9% beer, mine was, so I can't feel my cheeks. So that's a good thing. Mine's like, I mean, again, this is 4.8. Um, I don't know. It's, it's a, I'm going to give mine like, it, it's, it tastes like anything else. That's like a three. That's like an average 2.5 or like what? Is that two? What like, do they get? Oh, what's the average? Is the average already on here? Oh, 2.8 is the average. I forgot to even tell you what yours was. Um, I'm going to give it like a two star. It's like a very non-memorable. Um, I'm not anti-Russian. But I'm sure you are. It's just not very, this is not something I'd get again. What was, let's see your average real quick. Well, 3.9, you give it a four. So you're real close to it. Almost yeah. like, almost like you and picking football lines, you know, you're, you know, you're, you're pretty close. So. Sounds good, man. But we hope that, uh, yeah, people want to come and like find us on this craziness. Um, I think you can probably find us on. Untapped. You think untapped. You can download the app from the I, the Apple app store. Join us. Give us some recommendations of what you want us to drink. And if you, you know, send us something, we'll drink it. We'll drink it on here and give you okay. our time. If we can find it, we can drink it. If you send it to us, we'll love you. We can, we can find it. We can find it. Got a friend, I, well, I, have a friend I want people to ship us stuff. That's even better. But I have a friend who owns the liquor store, so we can get it. So just give us some recommendations of what we want. And even more fun, tell us what you want to drink and come on the show and we'll, we'll do it there. So um, anyway, hope everybody has a good week. Thanks for joining us. Cheers. We'll see you soon. Thanks, everybody.